Thank you so much, Salaima, for that introduction. I am very, very grateful to be here. I admire you all so much. So to be able to speak to you about a subject that is very dear to my heart, that has captivated me for most of my life is a pleasure. I hope you all find it as interesting as I do. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen. I put together some slides to help um, kind of convey and express this subject. I think, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I have a lot to cover. I, I hope I, I'm able to to do it in a, in a coherent way. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, so I, I want to say that my interest in storytelling, screenwriting, mythology, psychology, philosophy, and you know the unconscious, which we know as our dreams, and consciousness, which I would say is our deeper dream, began a long time ago. Uh, but the more I think about it, the more I keep realizing that it began earlier and earlier, as if it was almost a, a part of me all along. Um, unfolding, say, gradually in time. And conversely, in a very fascinating way, it has also been a journey backwards in time for to learn about mythologies, also to learn about the evolution of the human psyche. So as uh, Sulaima mentioned briefly, you know, so I, I founded Open Screenplay because I really learned that stories are incredibly powerful. They're way too powerful to be monopolized by a few industries. And I created this platform with the intent to disintermediate um, sort of the agency system that has limited diverse perspectives from appearing and to kind of distribute the, the power of stories amongst um, everybody. Um, it also came from a, a belief that I think the, the crisis of meaning that many of us face in our lives is a result of the stories that have been told to us by our cultures and by the influential organizations in our societies. And I also believe that we can regain this lost meaning um, in our lives by understanding our own personal unique stories. So for me, you know, I recognized early on that going to the movie theater was, I would say, a religious experience. You know, when you walk into a religious building, they are designed in a very specific way. You know, they, they, are, they have these massive columns, they have tinted windows, they make you feel small. You walk in with people you don't know, you sit and you face a stage and somebody stands before you and tells you a story. All of this is designed to make you experience a shift in consciousness. And when you hear that story, you in a way transcend together. I realized that this is actually very similar to the experience of going to a movie theater. You know, the seats may be more comfortable, but it is designed, we know, dark room, stadium seating, a massive screen to make you feel small, and a story unfolds with people that you don't know, and you transcend together in that story that you witness. And the thing about movie theaters is that they're far more powerful than hearing somebody just say, you know, talk about it. They are, we regard them as experientially real, you know, so stories are very, very, very powerful in that sense. And why are they powerful? Well, I'd like to propose that each and every one of you lives in a story. Um, you are the main character and you see the world from a first person perspective that's rested upon your shoulders. You know, when somebody asks you, how was your day? You tell them a story. And you know, when we see stories, they influence us because we see the uh, journey of a main character and they go through a psychological arc. And when we see them go through that psychological arc, we learn the lesson they learned. So, you know, I also find it very fascinating that us rational thinking people today and rationalism is, you know, kind of put up as the highest virtue these days, um, that we're so happy to suspend our disbelief and watch a movie about flying monsters or superheroes. And more than simply watch, right, we're taken in by these movies. We laugh, we cry, we feel excited. Um, and, you know, I think it's actually because we're all yearning to be part of a better story. One that removes us from our regular lives and takes us on a journey that is imbued with meaning. And even if it's just a few hours and even if, if it's fiction for, as the famous saying goes, fiction lies to us in the most truthful manner. In other words, I would say that, you know, we gravitate to watching stories, um, even if it's for mere entertainment, because they make us feel more alive than our regular lives. Um, you know, essentially we're, we are watching reproductions of living. And I think this is a profound statement about um, the current state of affairs with regards to how we feel our lives are unfolding in position to the world around us. And for those of you that aren't convinced, well, there's definite science to back it up. Um, this is a study that was done to show the power of narrative stories. There was um, a, two groups of people that were split up and given the same exact words to memorize. One group was given it just, you know, random words to memorize. The other group was given these words woven into a story. And the ones that heard those words in a story had a 
um, uh, ability to recall those words. So stories seep into our minds quite profoundly. Other studies that have been out there, one by Yuri Hansen and Princeton University, where they literally connected fMRIs to people's brains. And they found that when a storyteller tells a story, the listener's brain waves sync with the storyteller. Um, and this, sto this study was actually even then further confirmed in Drexel University, where they connected even more enhanced um, um, tools to you know, read the brain waves. And basically, study after study tells us what we've already confirmed and known intuitively for centuries. So interestingly, now we know that power stories are powerful. When you look up the word myth, or the definition of myth, and this is the Google image um, um, that tells us what myth is. It tells us it's a traditional story, especially one concerning the early history of a people or explaining some natural or social phenomenon and typically involving supernatural beings or events. And if you look at the definition below, number two, it says a widely held but false belief or idea. I think that's very interesting. I think it's ironic that it says that because I think it's a statement about, I would say the falsehoods in our current way of thinking, or if you will, the short termness of our collective memories. You know, for those of us who I would say dare to question our rational minds, Plato tells us that all knowledge is remembering. In fact, Plato, who's considered one of the founders of, of philosophy, said that the important, that myth is incredibly important because it allows us to explore ideas beyond philosophy and beyond language. In fact, the ancient Greeks distinguished between two ways of speaking and acquiring knowledge, mythos and logos. From mythos came intuitive narration, from logos, logical deliberation. Both were essential. They were not in conflict, but complementary. Each had its own sphere of competence and it was considered unwise to mix the two. So I would say logos gave, us, gave rise to mathematics and science. Myth gave rise to the arts. Logos explained how the sun rises, how babies were born and took humans to the moon. Myth explained why the sun rises, why babies are born and why humans went to the moon. Myth gives purpose, meaning and validation to existence. Myths of course can be religious as many of us know, describing such ideas as heaven and the eternal soul, or they can be secular, describing ideas such as sovereignty and human rights. Many of us don't really consider that. In the final analysis, you either accept myths or you don't. So if myth is an idea, mythology is the vehicle of that idea, the symbols, the stories, and the rituals. These are the languages that are seen, heard, and performed. For example, the symbol of the cross, the ritual of baptism, and the story of resurrection make up the myth or the idea of Christianity. The symbol of the flag, the ritual of the national anthem, and the story of the founding fathers make up the myth or the idea of a nation. So in our culture today, if you, like most people, reject myths or hold them in contempt, and we proclaim that humans are but a random fluke that merely emerged from a mechanical universe, a meaningless universe, essentially, I would say, ironically, that is your myth. Uh, you may call it the mechanical universe myth. Whatever your myth is, I would say, be careful because it will surely affect the dreams that dwell in your unconscious, and more importantly, the, I would say, deeper dream of your waking consciousness. So in other words, it'll affect how you feel towards the world. And I think that's a major question for us to ask because how we feel towards the world impacts our relationship to the world and how we behave towards the world. So there's a very fascinating idea in mythology in that the quote unquote source of life, if you will, is inscrutable. It is always a mystery and it will always remain a mystery. And that the unknown will always grow in geometric proportion to the known. So we'll never really be able to say what the source of life is. We'll be able to say what it's like. So myth is subjective truth, which is not the opposite of objective truth. Rather, it is a finite expression of the infinite. So objective, you know, all truth needs a frame of reference and objective truth needs, you know, a, the human or human mind, human senses that we all see together and we say it's objective. Well, I mean, subjective truth is that from a own personal, um, you know, perspective, um, you know, I would say we're, we're not dealing with the world of matter. We're dealing with the world of what matters. And what's very interesting is that the word matter actually comes from the Sanskrit root uh, meaning to measure. So it's um, even the word matter is, 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 is something that we, it's, it's a measurement of reality. It's almost a symbol that we apply to uh, reality. And even in you know, colloquial language, we say, does, does one 
you know, does one measure up? So what matters is, does it, do you, does it measure up? Does life measure up, um, et cetera? Another very interesting idea um, for me is um, the Rorschach blot. There's an idea that the world in itself is a Rorschach blot. Rorschach was the psychologist who invented the psychological test whereby arbitrary ink blots were presented to a patient and then the patient was to describe what they interpreted. And the images seen are an essentially like within the arbitrary blots of ink. So for example, patients who suffered from PTSD, for example, saw images that were related to their traumatic event that they're experiencing, which really indicates that the world outside our skin is a reflection of the world inside our skin. So if you look at the image that's in this Rorschach block, does it inspire you? Does it make you feel anxious? Each and every one of us will reply differently. And in just the same way, each and every one of us will see the world differently. Some look outside and they see a universe of objects created by a creator a benevolent monarch, a king of the cosmos, um, who watches our every step. Others have dethroned the monarch um, entirely, but kept his creation. And they see the objects around us as artifacts that were created by random fluke. And whether you adhere to the monarch myth or the mechanical universe myth, they're both myths. And again, by myth, I don't mean a lie. I mean rather an image idea or an abstract metaphor in which you interpret the Rorschach blot of the world. And this image or metaphor has profound influence on how you behave with the world. Uh, like I said before, it impacts how you feel towards the world. So I would say the, this, this image of the world or the metaphor of the world that you see or that um, you know, understand was constructed by the stories that you were told. And this is actually why religions are a set of stories. Um, they literally create the world for you. Words are exceptionally powerful. I mean, hence, you know, hence the term spellbind, right? You're a, so to me, it means a victim of spelling. Um, I think there's a reason why the Bible, um, you know, says, you know, God said, let there be light. You know, it used the word said for, for a reason. And there's a very important passage, I think, in the Bible that says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So it's an expression of the fact of how words, when told to you and explained to you, especially in, when they're conveyed through stories, um, can significantly impact how you see the world. I would say stories are the atomic unit of, of messaging. Um, and they're powerful because they carry information. And that information is a lesson or an idea that can psychologically influence you. Um, and it's the reason why our ancestors use storytelling as a way to pass down information and influence behavior over generations and across time. Um, so, what kind of stories did our ancestors tell us? Well, for centuries, our ancestors constantly encountered the unknown and through their collective wisdom as human beings represented the different ways to encounter the unknown in their stories. The stories were really about, you know, how to behave in the world and how to succeed in behaving in the world. The story of heroes, if you will. Um, there's an idea that the stories that we receive from our ancestors are actually meta stories or amalgamations of smaller stories that were put together. Um, and in telling us stories about past heroes, our ancestors were conveying, you know, information on how to behave in the world and what pitfalls to avoid. They tell us about where we came from, where we are, and how to orient yourself at certain, to, to arrive at a certain destination or how to avoid other destinations. This is a grave of uh, Neanderthal. I think that dates back 50,000 years. And it's the first indication of the human imagination or the human belief in myth, because the, the Neanderthal was, was um, buried with animals and with tools, um, indicating that, you know, they believed that there was a passage somewhere else, um, that they were, that this person that died was going to go into another world that they almost intuitively um, felt, which is quite fascinating. Um, and, you know, these myths are about the fact that, you know, humans, we easily fall into despair, you know, and from the very beginning, these stories help place us in a larger setting that reveal a sort of underlying pattern and give us a sense that against all the depressing and chaotic evidence to the contrary, life has meaning and value. Um, you know, rituals are an enactment of a myth. You know, if you go to a church and you were to see um, a baptism or a communion, it's a, it's a really an enactment of the story of Jesus. So if you're asked many of you, do you guys participate in rituals? Many of us will say, no, not really. But if we think about it, we do. In fact, you know, when you go to a funeral, you're participating in a, in a ritual. And these myths, you know, created these rituals to help us essentially cross thresholds of transformation in our own lives, whether it's to say, you know, goodbye to a loved one or, um, um, uh, 
go through a fail of difficult failure in your life um, or go through puberty, if you will, in, in the Jewish tradition, all the myths are designed to help us say goodbye to our old selves and be reborn essentially. And they're not about opting out of the world in any way. Rather, they're about helping us live more intensely in the world. You know, in reading the oldest, the creation myths from the different cultures, um, and this is going from Mesopotamia, the Sumerians and Mesopotamia, Greek myths, Hindu myths, the Abrahamic traditions, they all have something that's very, very interesting. They all describe the universe as being one before it's separated, spirit and body, heaven and earth, um, or separated into different various elements, into a world of duality or world of opposites, uh, if you will, you know, up and down, good and evil positive and negative. And I wonder, you know, that if these creation stories are actually metaphors about the universal human experience starting from birth. You know, after all, we were all one in the womb of our mothers before the catastrophic and I would say simultaneously heroic act of birth when we were separated into individuals and thrust into this world of opposites. You know, every child comes out of their mother's womb screaming and crying and you know, the child is then given to their mother to listen to her heartbeat to reduce that anxiety. Um, Freud, whether you love him or hate him, said that the source of all anxiety is the moment of separation from birth. And you know, after we're born, the thing that's fascinating is that the human psyche is permanently impacted by the fact that compared to any animals, we are the longest dependent on our mother's breast. We are born too soon. You know, we're unfinished, unready to meet the world and our survival and protection against a universe of dangers is wholly dependent on the mother. We are a dual unit, um, not only physically, but psychologically. And as a result, you know, for example, the mother is the first object of our love. And when we feel hunger pangs, we are fed by our mother's breast. So for example, to the infantile psyche, um, you know, to be fed is to be loved, essentially. So if the mother is absent, you know, or disciplines the child, the object of love gets complicated as the first object of hostility. And, you know, they say the unfortunate father is the intrusion, you know, to the mother infant bond. So he competes for the mother's attention and he's experienced in a way as something that's hostile and feelings of hostility are transferred towards the father. Um, and, you know, I say this because this really constructs the human psyche and the experience of birth and the relationships with our mother and father build the foundations of um, our psyche and which are retained really in the unconscious and become the basis of all images of bliss, truth, beauty, perfection, hostility, and aggression. And these are the foundations of the, Im of our, of the images of our emotions and which are then created into myths and stories. So um, after you know, our separation, you know, we are then thrust into the world on our own individual journeys. And you know, in all stories, um, each and every one of us are on a journey from point A to point B. You know, I would say from what is to a place, uh, a place that is insufficient in some manner to a place of what should be, a place that is somehow better. But on our way, we, were in, we will inevitably experience the unexpected or the unknown, which is what our ancestors were trying to address in their stories. And the renowned mythologist, Joseph Campbell, um, in reading all the stories from our various cultures, found a very common structure that is found, you know, quite fascinating called the hero myth. And in the common, you know, most common story structure, you have a flawed protagonist that is in pursuit of a goal. And standing in their way lies the personification of the unexpected obstacle, the opponent. When the protagonist attempts to overcome the obstacle, they fail and plunge into chaos. And at their lowest point, the protagonist is usually assisted by an influencing character that helps them recognize and transcend their flaw. In doing so, the protagonist's previous self dies and they are reborn. And the protagonist is able to voluntarily face the opponent in the final battle and climax. And in their resolution, the protagonist has emerged with a lesson learned in which they return to share with everybody. And the character flaw here is very important because fragility is said to be a condition to heroic behavior. So to paraphrase the renowned psychologist, Carl Jung, you're in a story, whether you know it or not. If it's somebody else's story, you might be getting a small part that you don't want. If you don't know that you're in a story, it might be one with a very bad ending. So I will you know, ask you, what is your story? How did you arrive at your current psychological state? What character flaws did you overcome? If you don't know how you got here, well, you, know, you might not know where you're headed. So if you don't know where you're headed, well, 
you may be in trouble because like all protagonists in a story, you will encounter the unexpected. When you do, you may descend into chaos. And the question is, will you recognize your flaw? Will you experience a death and rebirth and face your dragon? Or will the dragon swallow you and thus you will become one with the dragon hoarding gold that is of no real value to you. So while the hero's journey is one of you know, self-discovery, um, it's actually you know, a self-discovery of the individual, but it's also at the same time, it's an archetypal journey. Uh, stories connect us because we experience very similar um, you know, character arcs. We relate you know, to the journey that anyone else can go through by learning the lesson that they learned. Um, and these stories are super powerful because they sh shape our collective conscious. And, you know, you know, I, for me, I would say it's an iterative, this, this process of recognizing your flaw of, of con you know, facing your fear is an iterative process. It's a continual process that repeats itself. And, you know, the, you know, facing that dragon, you know, it's, you know, these, our fears are, you know, symbolized in things like dragons or snakes or monsters um, because they're terrifying. And they really are. Um, but if you face them, you realize that they are holding a key to the journey of the discovery of the self. And when you take that key and you open the door, you then enter into, I would say, the labyrinth of your own psychology, where you then have to navigate and try to understand. And, um, um, you know, it is said you find the golden seeds of childhood, which help, you know, you, you know, sort of unite your unconscious and your consciousness. They help um, mend a divided self, if you will. And, you know, the idea that this iterative process repeats is, is fascinating because every time you learn something about yourself and, you know, what is fascinating about Muslim mythology is that it says that, you know, virtue or learning something is, is simply a pedagogical prelude to the highest culminating insight, which is that there's no such thing as the self and that we were never separated from the world to begin with. Um, you know, and this is a very complicated subject, and I'm trying to wrap this all up in this in this small talk. But the idea is that you know you keep going through these experiences of, of self discovery, only to learn that the self is essentially an illusion. And this feeling of separateness that many of us feel to the world is something that we were conditioned to believe, and that's kind of why we feel like we want to control the world um, and 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 uh, control the outside world. And in our attempt to control it and master it, we are in many ways destroying it. So. You know, to wrap it up, um, a quote that I've, I recently come, came across that was very powerful is that, you know, spiritual enlightenment or awakening is the difficult process um, by which the increasing realization that everything is as wrong as it can be flips to everything is as right as it can be. And that changes your perspective, your image, your relationship to the world. So I think that... Uh, that's enough for, for the subject. I, mean, I can go on and on and on about the subject. I mean, there's even, there's many creation stories that if you interpret them will blow your mind um, psychologically. So mm -hmm. I will leave it at uh, that.